Hello, everybody. Recently, I caught up with my old friend Guy Yakov at a clubhouse room where we talked about life in the startup world. Guy has successfully led two startups to acquisition, initially Dementra to Oracle, and most recently Profit Tech to Zebra. You know, if I think of the top 20 conversations of literally thousands I've had over my career, two of them were with Guy. Uh, in this uh, room, we talk about the ups and downs of life in the startup world, the importance of relationships, and how to think through the age-old discussion of whether to go horizontal or vertical initially. Give it a listen and let us know what you think. Hey, we are, we'll be talking to Guy Yakov about being involved in two successful startups, Demand, uh, Demandra going to Oracle and Profit Tech going to Zebra. So Guy, thanks for joining us today. Hey, great, great to be here. Always good to speak with you, Jeff. I'm excited and cannot wait for our discussion. Oh, it's you and me both. Why don't you start us off because you've done, not only done one amazing thing, you've done it twice. You've successfully been acquired by small, the two small companies, Oracle and Zebra. Why don't you take us on your journey? What, what was it like? How did you get started? How did you come up with this idea once and then not only once, but twice? Yeah, I'd like to start with just even an introduction of my career path, if you will. After my first position, my first job was actually a developer. And I was a really bad developer. <laughs> I actually, I didn't like people finding bugs in my code. And, and I had plenty off. And so I moved into product management. And then, and then I was hired as number four in the, the mantra, the first type of uh, journey, if you will, the mantra, and build up the office in the U.S. When you mentioned before, you mentioned successfully. That's another area that I would like to define a little bit more. How do you define success? with an entrepreneur that sold the company to another company. I would go into the, the human uh, factor, right? The people. So the first exit, when we sold it to Oracle, the investors or the later investors that I was engaged with made a nice multiple. The people, they promote their careers, I would say, more than getting all the employees getting a bunch of, of money out of it. But if you look at the success of uh, the mantra, even today, Oracle is still maintaining the brand. If you go to Oracle the mantra, you'll see that Oracle is still selling. There's still teams on R&D, on sales that are actually selling it. And if you look at the teams that I had as part of the mantra, they prosper on their career everywhere. In IBM, in McKinsey, in a uh, few people, top executives at PepsiCo and, and other places. From a human perspective, I would say the first one was definitely successful. Also on the second, on the, as well as, by the way, the customers. A lot of the customers that I still meet in conferences are telling me how amazing the mantra is. As a matter of fact, one of uh, the quick service restaurant customers of mine from 2001, they're still using the mantra to forecast 15 minutes increment on the menu items today. And think about the technology over 20 years. It's like five decades of technology in technology terms. They're still using it. That's the definition of success for me. And the second one, Profitech, is only two years ago that we sold it to Zebra. And besides the investor multiplier that they've made, besides the employees, the immediate kind of money that they made through the transaction. We didn't lose much of the people within Zebra. The retention is pretty, pretty good. And people are enjoying their time at Zebra. And I think Zebra is a fantastic company to be acquired by. The culture is fantastic. And it's always uh, fun to work with smart people. And I think that the definition of success is definitely on the Zebra side. Going back to your question about how we started it or the journey and how the journey started. When you start the journey, you never think about the and the, the why, Phoenix word, why, is not about, you're not making it for the money, you're not making it for the career. And if you do, you need to go back to the mirror and ask yourself, do you really want to go and build that company? Because I can tell you the journey on both journeys were not easy. <laughs> Definitely not the easy button. I'll tell you a few bumps later on, but you're not doing it for the successful exit. The initial thought on the demand side actually started with the co-founder, Bob Feldman, where his wife went to buy a snack for the kid, the crying kid, that is, and she couldn't find the snack that he liked. And now, by the way, this kid now is 20 years, 28 years old right now, and he's camping on the Rocky Mountains. But because she couldn't fulfill the need for the kid, because she couldn't find it on the shelf, she said, hey, 
how come those massive CPG companies and retail companies do not know and how to plan in order to have it on the shelf? And so this is how the mantra actually came about. And the word the mantra was coined by Bart after a four-hour flight to Seattle. I think it was to meet Boeing, Boeing, the, the, the airplane company. And it was demand is our mantra because it was all about, hey, let's just focus on demand. And from that moment, let's figure out what do we need in order to fulfill demand and start planning it backwards. So that was the first idea. The second idea, unless you have any other questions, Jim, I can go to the second idea. No, go. So the, the second idea, I was asked by some investors to look at their portfolio company. And Profitec was an ongoing company, was a consulting company. And it was three years in the making. It was selling, I think, about $200,000 a year. It had about 68 people and super smart people. But it was a consulting uh, gig. And so the whole idea was, hey, let's go into a retailer uh, business and let's take their data and tell them, hey, you're losing money by those areas. And when I interviewed them in order to find out what is the magic, they said, oh, we have templates. We we'll take the data and we have templates. We know what to look for because we've done that before. And when we look for things, we then tell them, oh, this is how you lo- you're losing your customers. This is how you're losing margin. This is where you're wasting money on, on freshness, on sending unsellables to, to the dumpster. And so... The idea then came through the brainstorm of, hey, listen, that's not scalable because you're burning $10 million in two years and making only $200,000, so something needs to change. And so the idea of, hey, how about we load their data, and since we know what to look for, we start looking for patterns of behavior in the data, and when we find those patterns, we automatically tell them what they should do and then build a workflow to tell them what they should do. Therefore, we don't need to consult anymore, but they can buy an off-the-shelf kind of consulting in the box solution and retailers start liking it. And so we went into a development spree, and by 2012, we had our first customer who was uh, Abercrombie & Fitch, which I can go into the other stories of first customers and how to sell. That's a whole different chapter here today. Let's get to that in a little bit. So when we first we first met, it was at an Oracle party, as I recall, at NRF. Um, and we had a, a, just a terrific conversation very late at night. And then I, I didn't really bump into you a whole lot until that pro, until Profit Tech came up. And if you remember, it was, I believe it was at the Del Coronado out on the deck where you were pitching mm-hmm. me this idea. At that point, though, that was software, I think. So you had already made the position, uh, reposition from consulting to software? Absolutely correct. Yes. What we did is it took us about a year and a half to take all of the idea, all the, what I call the IP, the wet, wetware, right? What those people had in their brain, take it to a few sprint of development, share it with Abercrombie and Fitch CIO, who, by the way, is an amazing guy, John Dean, retired, but not really. Uh, like you, Jeff, you're retired, but not really. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, I was and, retired until you got into my life again and kicked me in the backside. So <laughs> I blame you. But but yeah, we engaged Abercrombie and Fitch at the time and we just started delivering value. And so a lot of more retailers wanted to join, join the, uh, the customer and the success. And uh, that's where uh, we went to I think it was, yeah, it was uh, maybe an NRF IT conference that I met you in yeah, San Diego was, or something. It was, it was, no, nah, it was, it was a Del Coronado and it, NRF tech or something. It was hot as blazes. So it had to be in the summer. I, I remember I, had, I was sweating like a, <laughs> and we uh, were sitting on the deck and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because I think this is probably the important point to have this little debate uh, with you. If you remember what was I pushing you on? Do you remember that conversation? It was, I think it was, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Bingo. Yeah. And you were coming in and tell, I was telling you about how amazing the technology is. And you were telling me, hey, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And, and frankly, at that time, we tried to solve a problem that a lot of companies up until recently didn't know that they have, and that was our problem. So another tip for any entrepreneur is 
Please make sure your target audience know and understand the problem that you're trying to solve. Don't make it a new problem, which is, which is an issue, by the way, I had with my first company as well. So I'll, I'll touch by that in a second. But the problem that we're trying to solve, we phrase it as, listen, people solve a lot of things with reports, but people don't understand reports. And therefore, if you're sending reports to a bunch of people and you assume that they will know how to read it and do something with it, you'll be wrong because people understand reports differently. But listen, this problem is a good problem to have, but it's not the real problem that we're solving. The real problem that we're solving is on-shelf availability that you're trying to solve with report and report the shrink at the teal that people are trying to solve with reports, but reports would not solve it. And as an entrepreneur, as an engineer, we were thinking, hey, we're solving world hunger. People are solving stuff with reports, but now they don't need the reports. We can solve it. But that's a geeky discussion with an IT person. But if you're speaking with store operation executives or supply chain executives, the problems you're trying to solve are 10,000 feet below what you just said. It's more around the business problem on-shelf availability, out of stock, supply chain latency, loss prevention and shrink, waste and fresh reduction, right? Fresh improvement, waste reduction. Do you remember that discussion? No, I remember it like, like, the, like it was yesterday. And by the way, I use that discussion to frame literally almost every conversation I have with founders. Because if you remember... And I think you guys might have, you didn't get testy because you're such a cool operator, but I think Adam was, as I recall, was getting a little testy with me because I was pushing to try to understand what you were doing. I literally could not understand what you were doing. And I'm trying to, so one, I was trying to figure out where you said, and it's the term now that's probably going to be on my uh, tombstone. I want to pigeonhole you. And that's not negative. That's positive in, in that I want to understand where you sit, where you were going to sit in my framework. And, or and did I have to rebuild my framework, which I absolutely did not want to do? I'm not sure we ever really figured out where you did sit. And then uh, you, you go off and get acquired. So obviously you were right and I was wrong. But it's a challenge. And we'll get into this in, in, in a couple of minutes when we start talking about how to work with analysts. But gosh, and we spent we, we had to spend an hour going back and forth as to what you're trying to do. Were you were you soft? First of all, I had to decide whether you were software or solutions or, uh, or services because it felt a little servicey. Then once, where do you sit? Is it BI? Is it is it analytics? All that sort of stuff. Who should you talk to in the Gartner world? And there was probably fifteen or twenty people that you could have potentially talked to. You get a little bit limited when you focus on retail because some of the horizontal analytics people don't necessarily want to get into a vertical specific solution. But that was the point of that whole conversation. I don't know if he realized that or not, but it, I wasn't fighting. I was just trying to wrestle with, hey, where, what do I do with you guys? I totally agree. And, and just from, from what we'll talk later, but I believe as you and Paula spoke about last time on the last call that you had, relationship with the analyst is key. And, and why am I saying it? Because you and I knew each other by then. So I understood that your questions are not to pigeonhole us into a small niche. Adam, my co-founder, came at that as saying, oh, the analysts just want to pin me into something that is smaller. And that's because you and him just didn't have the relationship. So it just, show you, it just show you that relationship is so key. Now, yeah, when you're an entrepreneur and you think about, should I have a vertical play, only retail, should I have a horizontal play, but then you're not focused? I would go for a focus first approach, right? Retail first, because the traction will be much faster. You can then go to another retailer or another, sorry, another later. By the way, it will be tougher later because you'll be already pinned all into, hey, you are a retail solution provider. It's double-edged sword, but it will be easier than starting in the beginning and have a one retailer, a one CPG, a one electronic manufacturer, one industrial money, because then you're nothing to everyone rather than something so, for someone. But, you know, so God, let me stop you there because that's such an interesting point. Typically, it's always horizontal to vertical unless it's a unless it's a vertical specific solution. But what you just said there, when I'm thinking about because you probably could have gone really to any vertical, I would think, with profit tech, right? You're basically looking at, at data. Absolutely correct. Let me then give you some, some inside secret sauce of the, the profit side. The plan was to start going into new vertical and actually get funds 
to help us do. And we got probably six, seven private equity people telling us, hey, I'll give you X million of dollars and support you to move into a new vertical. At the same time, Vibra came and approached us and said, hey, what, how about we'll just acquire you guys and help you grow as part of the Zebra technology company. But that was an option on the table. That was the plan all along. It's to start with retail, then move to CPG, move to healthcare, complex manufacturing and others, because we could have picked any one of those verticals. Yeah. So as an analyst in thinking about your strategy, because we didn't talk about this, I'm literally just hearing you say this for the first time. I guess a tip to the founders are analysts that operate inside a vertical, like with me, I'm retail, I'm retail Hardware, soft, hardware software services. I have far deeper relationships with other players inside that vertical than I would and being able to help founders more, much more than if you just went horizontal and then you, because the horizontal analysts that cover AI or BI or whatever you're, whatever piece you're working on have many more vendors. And so that strategy guy was, is really interesting because I think that probably helped you an awful lot to get traction early and gain, gain a, a head of steam and then make that move or, be, or make the acquisition. Or be act, be acquired. That that's interesting. I have to think yeah, about that a lot more. We, we need also. We, we do need to add the caveat, and we could probably do a whole talk about it. But the caveat is, when we were acquired, we were a retail and CPG company. If we would have wanted to go into healthcare, it would have been a big investment. Now, why? Because of three reasons. Number one, the DNA of the company was built on retail and CPG, right? So, moving into a healthcare or another a new vertical would be a big investment. The analysts would call you out as a retailer in CPG, and the customers, that's the third angle, would see you as a retailer in CPG. So if, if I would call on a complex manufacturing who is $25 billion in, in sales, they would not understand why am I even pitching to them or talking with them or asking them questions because I'm a retail person. And I'm speaking right now with a few uh, friends that are building companies and are actually on the second and third phase. So, you know, 50 million and above. And they have a tough time moving between verticals. And what I, my recommendation to them was, listen, you need to change the DNA of the company to move into this vertical because you need a relationship with a new analyst, you need a relationship with a customer, and you need to speak the language yeah. of that vertical. And in order to do that, the best thing would be to hire a general manager for that vertical because they will need to build a go-to-market. So I can speak about the idea about that also for he does have a double-edged sword on the focus of a vertical listen guy you need to teach an mba a series of courses on every, every bullet point you have is a completely uh, whole separate a line of, of, of discussion L let's just close off on that one point and say i think you can move into a vertical but you have to buy relationships inside that vertical and i think that's the point that's the big investment and i cannot emphasize enough to founders listen you could be a, the most horizontal technology on the planet if you don't speak the, the 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 language of the vertical you are digging yourself a gigantic hole i most analysts that, that are vertical specific like me in retail I'm looking, I'm just looking for the horizontal terms that, that, that aren't retailized. One, because it's just an easy call out and it's an easy way to have a little bit of fun. And guy, to this day, I still see very horizontal terms with founders that are trying to do something in retail and it, it takes 10 seconds just to convert into the, the language. And that tells me they haven't done that. The really big tip there. Let's, let's transition a little bit into how you raise money. So you've done it now twice. What, what was that like? What's that journey like? Yes, it was a little bit different. On the first, on the first company, I was more the exec, ex executor, if you will, owning sales, product management, delivery, less on the finance. Besides the D round, the last round before we were acquired, at that time I was more engaged on the roadshow. Obviously, with Profit Act, I was much more engaged because I was the CEO. On the first company, I was not the CEO. I actually hired the CEO who is fantastic. You should probably have on the show as well. Bill Seibel, he just released a really nice book uh, about the uh, the entrepreneurship uh, journey as well. I learned a lot from him. But the VC, so in the VC, when you walk into a roadshow plan, I think that the key is very similar to selling to an analyst, selling to a customer, and selling to a VC. It's similar, but it's different. First of all, you need to know and understand the why. You cannot be the Simon Sinek why. You cannot be in business because you want to exit. Now, it's a little bit foolish because you're going now to a VC. Obviously, the VC will invest in you 
because they want an exit. That's their, that's their business. But I believe that the, the exit is a core product. It's not something that you think on a daily basis. It's not something that you target, right? You, you target the journey. You target the why. And the why for me and my co-founder were always about impacting the life of our customer's career. The consumer, the person that used the tool will impact their career because they will provide value for their company and it will be such an amazing value. That person will progress. Now, the same thing about your employees, right? Because if the employees are there and you're growing so fast, you're going to impact their life too. But I think that's a cool kind of why. And I met a lot of successful entrepreneurs that was their why. They love impacting people's life in that way. Now, it's easy to say why, but you need to find the why and you need to find your own why. And when you walk into a VC, first of all, let's, let's talk about booking the meeting because to, today it's not 10 years ago. Today, there's more money in the market than what VCs can find to do with. So I think that today, and, and by the way, I didn't do a road, road show for a while. So it may be, may be wrong, by the way, may be wrong. But it seems like there's more money in the market waiting for good investment than 10 years ago. 10 years ago, to get a VC to answer your phone call for 30 minutes was a challenge, right? It was a challenge. Money was scarce. You needed to have a reason, synergy with that type of VC. Now, today I would say to an entrepreneur the same way, even though a lot of VCs want to put money in your, in your journey, you need to make sure that person, you would put them and join them into your life. Because once they invest in you, it's like they join you in bad, for good and bad. And you should not just look for their money. Money is an important component, but... Have they done similar investment in the past that they were successful with? Do they have templates that they can help you? Do they know analysts? Do they know customers? C-level, we call it the village. Do they have people? Let's say that, let's say that the vertical that you're targeting is healthcare. Do they have people that they know, C-level executive in healthcare, that can help you, guide you through your journey? It's way more important than the money. Way more important because that means success and failure. And money doesn't mean this. When the fact that you have money doesn't mean that you're going to succeed, right? You need the network. You need the, the guidance. You need to listen more than you talk. I'm not doing it here because I, I speak twice as much as you, Jeff, on this call. But Well, you but better be. <laughs> no one wants to hear me talk. I want to hear you. Listen, you're laying down gold. What's interesting, Guy, is, let's see. So I've talked to Paula. So We've had analyst on analyst. We've had PR, AR. We keep all keep coming on the same theme. It's relationship. And network is relationship, but it's so important. What you're saying is so important that founders understand if you have to build your all the relationships from scratch, it's it's two years at least. If you can leverage somebody's existing relationship, either buy a relationship, bring somebody in that has those experiences, make sure your VCs have those connections, you're saving yourself an awful lot of time. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And the VCs, you, you have different kind of flavor. I can tell you that Adam and I did the roadshow of, uh, well, you know, in profit tech. And there's one one meeting that I, I will never forget. The meeting didn't happen, but I, I flew all the way to San Francisco for that meeting, waited in the parking lot because we always want to make sure that we know where we're going and we get there on time. So you want to put 30 minutes or even an hour buffer. So you get there, you park your car, you review your slides in the car, make sure that this is the building. You then walk up 30 minutes before the meeting while you tell the assistant or the receptionist, hey, I know the meeting is only 30 minutes, but I'm here just making sure that's the place. And then the assistant of that VC told us, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot to cancel it. He's in Europe. That was an <laughs> odd moment. And so I, I can tell you that I didn't want to speak with that VC anymore. I'm pretty sure he didn't want it. He was probably not interested in speaking with me too, by the way, because it was not there. You don't want to have a partner that doesn't give value to transparency, to calendar, to your calendar. I always tell even, you know, all my salespeople, always treat 
your calendar and treat the customer calendar and treat the receptionist calendar. Doesn't matter who you're speaking with. Treat them the same way that you want to be treated because right. time is the highest valued currency today. Boy, that's so true. So true. How do you have that much discretion, which VC you work with? Is it uh, probably some founders are just whoever's going to give me money, I'm just going to deal with it. But I, I actually, I would agree with your thought that how much money's out there. I'm starting to do a lot more look looking with, with Brian at, at Iterate about how much money's out there and just spending some time yesterday looking at the amount of money in AI, the amount of money in blockchain, it, I, it's in retail. It's unbelievable. It's billions of dollars that, that's trying to find homes. So how much control do you have? Who do you work with? Yes, I, I think that there's a lot of money in the market, I, but I, I want to make sure that people understand what I'm saying by that. I'm not saying that, hey, it's easy to recruit money. It's easy to collect. I, I, I don't. I think that anytime you speak with a VC, you need to be very prepared and you need to articulate the problem, the solution, the why you, who is your team member, what culture you want. There's a, there's a template that you need to do and you need to take it very seriously. But if you take it very seriously and you speak with more VCs than, than you, you plan. As I said before, time is the highest currency. But when you find the VCs, you better spend your time with them. Make the reference call. Ask other CEO, hey, what happened in the boardroom when you don't get, you don't get on the same page? Do you then do you go into a debate? Right? Is it a, do you feel like when you disagree, is it a pitch that the VC tell you? Is it a debate that someone is going to win or is it a discussion, which is, hey, let's just brainstorm what is the best solution? I read an article about those three things that are not the same, right? When someone's pitching to you, they want to convert you, right? When someone is debate with you, one of you will win. Here, there's no winning in the boardroom uh, besides everyone winning. You cannot have one winning, one losing. And so it needs to be more of a discussion. And so... Besides the connection that they have, besides the branding, by the way, some VCs they have a higher brand, right? If, if I get X compared to Y, maybe X in my retail, if I'm going into retail, maybe X has a much better branding. So I will put it on my website saying, hey, by the way, you're doing business with me. You're doing business with X who invested in me and they are well-known, right? Um, which, by the way, on Strategic investors like Zebra that invested in Profitech was great because Zebra is a great brand name in retail and they invested in Profitech, so it was another value pillar that I could use. But I, I strongly believe that you need also the, the, the third thing that you look at the VC is how do they operate in the boardroom? Do they value the input from the management team, from the CEO? How do they discuss it on the why to come to an agreement at the end? I think that's also critical because it's touched upon the culture thing that you wanted me also to speak about later. Let me underscore what you just said there, because my interactions with you when you were not so much in Demantra, we never bumped in, but when you were working profit tech, you were pretty skilled at that give and take. And I, I, I wouldn't because most founders aren't. And this is a conversation that Paul and I had a lot and, and Wendy and I had about analyst relations, that that right balance of being aggressive and back and forth, but not either being too hostile or, or not hostile enough. There's that right give and take. And I think you phrased it really well, that there shouldn't be a winner or a loser. And if you as a founder come and, and get started uh, a conversation with an analyst and you want to win that conversation, you've already lost because you might win it in your mind. I guarantee you've lost it in reality because that's just not how we yeah. roll. And, but the give and the take is the magic. So the, the test of the idea back and forth, here, here's what I think, here's what I don't think. That's, that's a real skill set that I don't think people value enough when they're in these conversations. It's, I got to win or I got to make my point. I got to prove my point. You're proving nothing. You're literally proving zero. And that's some really good advice. So, yeah, so give and take. So I, 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 am, a, I, I am also a, a guest professor for professional selling at some university here in Boston. But in the first class, we're talking about give and take and negotiation, right? If, if you're looking at an all negotiation, every negotiation, you're looking at the overall surface that the negotiation could end with, and you're trying to win it all, I'm telling you right now, you're going to lose it all. It, it's not, even when you buy a car, by the way, if you're going to make your salesperson that sells you the car, 
lose. He will not help you in a lot of other things when you need it. And so it's all about give and take. And personal life with my, my, my significant other, with my wife, with my kids, it's give and take. And it's the same with VCs, with customers, and with analysts. Listen, the analysts, Jeff, especially when you speak with the analyst, with a person, they don't get the money that you pay Gartner. They don't get it to their home, right? They don't bring it to their bank. I wish. So even if, <laughs> right? so even, even if you pay, it doesn't matter how much, I'm not, you know, 100000 200000 it doesn't matter how much you pay Gartner. Jeff doesn't need to listen to you if you're not interesting. And if you're not adding value to their pro- pro- profession. So how, when, so my, my, my tip for the founders is, how can you add value to an analyst? By speaking about real case studies of your customers, by connecting your customers with them, because that's what analysts need. Real life examples with customers that not just the vendor, the technology guru is talking about. So there's a give and take there as well, right? Oh, hundred percent. That's that was the theme that Joe Scarup and I really, really settled on, and I was really surprised when we had our, our clubhouse room that we both really wanted to see at least a customer win. It doesn't have to be a specific customer. It can be you know, a large retailer in the southeast, kind of a thing. But you really had to have something. And in my line of work, and which is why I was always careful which startups I fooled with, at least back in my Gartner days. I thought the best, because there's thousands of you, there's literally thousands of startups now in, in retail. And my, my, my sort of threshold was I needed to see one customer win because I thought that was the, the way to separate. I didn't, when I'm working with Oracle and SAP and Microsoft and all those folks, I don't have, I didn't have the time to go talk to a hundred guys, although it might've been fun, but it wouldn't have been productive. And so once that first retail win, boom, now you're on the clock. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me if it took you know, six months or six years, it didn't matter. That's when I started paying attention. So that's a really important point to have. And to get that first win, however you have to get it, it I would probably think it is pretty critical. Yeah, and, and by the way, talking now about how to sell the first customer or customers, there's this exactly give and take. If you are willing to not charge them too much or enough or what you think the price should be, there's a give and take. Hey, Mr. Customer. Are you willing to stick with Jeff from Gardner and return? I'll give you another 5% discount, 10% discount. And so think about the give and take as, as a whole. And when you speak with a customer, what else do you need from that customer in order to jumpstart other customers? Because it's a snowball. If you succeed, succeed with one, you want others to know about it so you can succeed with more. Fantastic stuff. So how did you scale these two companies? How did you build your management team? When did you start hiring sales? Probably probably sales first. Talk, walk us through briefly what, what that was like, because you've done it now twice. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start by talking a little bit about culture, because lately in the last year, two years, culture has been spoken about on inclusions and genders and other things more than before. But I, I truly believe in an all-inclusion type diversity culture. Now, why? Not because that's the uh, terms of, of, of the, the year, right? Not because if you really want to hear different opinion and uh, the startup cannot be a dictatorship, that's another thing that, <laughs> that, another thing that it will, will just kill you if you're trying to just make your own opinion count. If you want to listen to other ideas, you need to have an inclusive type uh, culture that everyone counts, that is as flat as you can be. Why do I say as flat as you can be? Because I always told all the management and all the people that ProfitEct is very flat organization, flat organization. Now, some people that joined me towards the end, just before we were acquired, they were telling me, guys, you guys are not flat. So by that, we were so big, we couldn't be really flat. But we're trying to listen to have a voice of every person in the company. And I think that's critical. And the management layer, you need to pick them right based on their attitude, not based on their knowledge. And I read a lot of articles on LinkedIn lately about that as well. And that was my motto. If you look at the management team, both at Demantra and in ProfitEx, they, at ProfitEx, for example, some of them didn't even work with retailers before. And so you say, oh, 
why did you hire that head of customer if they never worked with retailers? They're going to now work with retailers. The attitude that she had was more critical than the knowledge that she would then gain within the next six months. Because knowledge, you can gain knowledge. You can train people if they have the right attitude. So uh, from a management perspective, if you think about the culture, make sure that the attitude of the management is aligned with the culture you want to build. Because building culture, you cannot just say it. You cannot just say, hey, I'm going to build this culture, send an email to everyone, and from that moment, you have this culture. <laughs> culture you build over time. And, and you kill a culture or erase a culture is very easy. And so you need to make sure that you continue to build it on a continuous basis. By the way, the management, I was very lucky. I was very lucky with the management that we hired, that we had at, at Profitech. I think we only had, over the 10 years there, we only had one issue with one VP, one head of, doesn't matter who we are. I'm, not, I'm going to just tell you who, which, which group it was. But after about six months, we found out that there's, a, there's some asshole attitude. And we said zero tolerance to asshole attitude. And, and he was just, we just find a way to diverse from that person. But that was only one out of my 25-year career, I think, that a manager, an executive was needed to leave because of a misalignment with culture. Regional expansion. How far did you go with a profit tech? Did you get outside the U.S.? Uh, yeah, we outside of the U.S., yes, but that was also one of the plans that we plan to have. We had probably 10, 15 percent of our customers were in, in Europe by that time when we were acquired. But it was after. So when we started, we only focused on the U.S. Now, why? When you, and it depends on the vertical that you're going after, by the way, but when you're talking with retailers in Europe, they're asking you, which retailers do you have in the U.S.? When you're speaking with retailers in the U.S., they're asking you, which retailers do you have in the U.S.? <laughs> and so it was very easy to find out what you should start in the U.S. and then roll into other countries. Rolling into other countries it's not just the it's not just the, the 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 language. So even going from the U.S. to Canada, you'll find out that it's different. Canadian type companies has a different culture, but even in, in Europe, it's even more obviously because you have different languages. But because of the culture, you need boots on the ground. So if you're trying to sell in Italy, you better have some Italian group of people in Italy. Right? Because I, I can tell you, without naming the customer name, I'm sure that if they will hear now uh, my story, they will say, oh, that's me. But we were working with a, a, a large retailer in Italy. We had many dinners, both with even significant others that we were doing, because in Italy, it's a little bit different type of culture. And we, we couldn't transact on that until we were zebra, because we just didn't have people. People on the ground, not just speaking the language, but working the culture. Now, if you need, if you think as an entrepreneur, if you need a, an entity in Benelux, in France, an entity in the UK, every one of those entities, you need accountant, you need taxation, you need, there's a lot of investment dollars and time that you need to do in order to go to those areas, to those regions. And in APAC, it's, totally different ballgame as well. Even though in Australia they speak English, in Demantra we had our first Australian customer probably about a year before we sold it to Oracle. And we actually transact on that with two trips to Australia. But yeah, it's a different type of culture. I can, I can also give you some stories on the, the Australian customers. There's some interesting stories, but I'll do that. Later. Oh, well, I think, I think I'd like to schedule about two, at least two or three more rooms with you for sure to unpack some of that. Talk a little bit about trade associations because I, you were, let's see, you were pretty good at, at working through the, obviously you were at, I think it was NRF Tech. So at what point did you make, decide it was, it was worth making that pretty big investment and how, what are some advice you have about working with trade associations? So yeah, I don't know if Sammy Sackel will, uh, will hear about it, but she's amazing. And so does Rila and a relationship with Vicky as well. And all that, all those relationships and all those clicks, I think they're critical to your success. Why do I call them clicks? Because a lot of time, companies that invest in NRF, 
would go to Rila, or maybe we just send a few people to Rila, but fewer than people that are investing to going to Rila, and then they will send only a few people to, to NRF. So the clicks or the people or the community, let's call them community, the community that goes to NRF probably will not be that tight compared to the one that goes to Rila. And in Rila, you will find a community that is tight, but those tight people would not go to NRF. What does it mean? You as an entrepreneur with limited number of dollars cannot just go deep in both NRF, Rila, et cetera. You cannot just go into all of those conferences and communities. So what you should do first is invest a little in the beginning, go and check, is that the focus of the vertical that you're actually targeting? So for example, if you're going to fashion, would you have more fashion-oriented retailers in NRF or in real? If you're going after lighthouse account, will you have more lighthouse account? And I'm, again, I'm just picking two, but there's more, right? And then once you decide where you go, you need to have your dollars go a long way. And I'll have an example here. I'll just go with a story and we'll see. Worst case, you can erase it. And we hired a, a marketing, an amazing marketing head at, at Profiting. And it, it was a she, and we were about to go to NRF loss prevention. And I'm sure that Tammy Sackel and others will remember that event. Why? Because we didn't have enough, we didn't have enough money besides the booth, and we couldn't sponsor a presentation. We, by the way, when we go to a, a conference, we tend to go only if our customers are speaking. Because if they're speaking, well, they will mention our name or our brand and we'll be able to then leverage it and talking with analysts and with customers. Because if I go to the analyst, I'll say, hey, by the way, have you seen this customer presenting? If you couldn't go because you were busy, you may ask, hey, do you have the recording? And then you will see the recording. So the value obviously is customers to speak with, customers, customers to speak with, analysts, and, and not just the techie people speaking with customers and analysts. But... But you want to create a splash around your brand because at that time, we wanted to build a brand. And building the brand is different than just building a tactical sales uh, funnel. She put on the banner something that was, I, by the way, I, as, 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 as you can imagine from my accent, my South Boston accent, <laughs> uh, I, I actually didn't understand what it really means until <laughs> someone complained about the banner. But the banner said, Something along the line of, oh, what was it? Uh, it was with the bulls. Oh, you know what? Let me just search the banner. I'll come back to it. But it was controversial about data. Do you have, let me just think about it, because it was a really good tagline. But people start complaining about it because apparently it was uh, a, a sexual meaning. Oh, boy. And uh, they asked us to remove it. And guess what? A customer or actually a prospect came and asked if they can take the banner because they really <laughs> liked the, 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 the tagline. And analysts and people were coming to just joke about us about, about this banner because it was not, by the way, it was not gender specific. It was not, not racism. It was not, don't, don't go into those terrain. I'm not talking right. about those. But someone could have understood it as something that is jokingly about it. And by the way, people in the beginning said, oh, this is a bro culture. But when they saw, oh, it's a she, head of marketing, and she came up with it. Now the tone is a little bit different. Mm, and so I, I think that we got a lot out of that banner. Uh, people up until today remember that. And, and that's what you want as a brand. I think your point about spreading money around with trade associations really applies equally well to the various events organizations too. I think you definitely want to be, you want to think long and hard if you're a founder going hard with one or two of them, far better to understand the landscape. And I have, I've had that conversation quite a few times too. spread that money around, be very careful about going deep with somebody, unless you're absolutely sure that they're going to provide value. What about advisory boards? Did you set, I don't know, did, did Profit Tech have an advisory board? Yeah, we, we had a one that is, was very good. I would say I learned a lot from the somewhat failed bo advisory board that I had on the demand side. And I believe we did a really good job on the board of advisors at Profit Tech. And I think the difference was twofold, not even threefold. Uh, number one, the head of the board was a customer. Okay, so immediately when you do that, 
they have an interest because whatever the, the board of advisors will advise on the roadmap and on the, the branding and will have an immediate impact to their customer because they're a customer. So they're paying for what they get. And so that was a really good idea. I think. Besides that, on the board of advisors, we had, we had an analyst. We had a C-level executive on the IT side, C-level executive on the operation side. We had someone from a board. And by the way, we had on the board of advisors, we had 50% of each gender. By the way, even on the board of directors, we had, I think, 40% on each, you know, on, on female and 60 male. But in the management team, we had 50-50 all across. And we're, when we were acquired, we were 50-50 everywhere. R&D, marketing, everywhere. 50-50. It was really nice. But the board of advisors, we were meeting face-to-face twice a year. And between them, we had monthly projects. And, and I did pay them the expenses. I paid them uh, very low dollars per, um, per hour, but not much. But what I did do, I, I gave them a little bit of equity. And, and at the end, when we did the exit, they were super happy. They were actually, they forgot. So guess what? Most of them forgot that they have equity. And so when, we, when they got the check, they said, oh, that's fantastic. And so I got a lot of emails saying, hey, when am I joining your next board? Your next board. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that you need to listen to your board of advisors. You need to build it the right way. You need to give them tasks. And you need to continue guided because it can die on a vine really quickly. It could be a first, great first meeting and then nothing. And that's what we had in the mantra. We had four times over four years a really good first board of advisor meeting, but we never follow up on it. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, guys, I have a quick question. Uh, I know you've, uh, you've hugged it all, Jeff, there. I, but, I uh, did. Yeah, you, you've been amazing. On that very last point on board of uh, directors and, board, and advisory board. Did you make a switch from one to the other? Did you have both at the same time? A lot of startups that I work with are just focused on advisors and they don't really are not considering boards of directors until their first external VC round. So if your thoughts on that, mm-hmm. I would appreciate it. Absolutely. And yeah, you're, you're right. When you have the investors in, you need the board of directors more. Uh, I only had board of directors after the investments. But what I did, I fed one to the other. Typically, about a week or two after the board of advisors, we had a board of directors. A lot of times I had a board of advisor, uh, head of the board of advisors presenting 15 minutes to the board of directors. So it was not me as the CEO or the chairman of the board sending the message, but it was my customer who knows the industry, et cetera. They say the doctor comes out of town. So everywhere that you're trying to influence, it's always better to bring someone from the outside. And so you had, I had, actually towards the end of last year, I had a fantastic board of advisor and board of directors member that was the same. And I have to give her kudos. That's Andrea Weiss. If you're running a retail of billion dollars, you should definitely give her a call. She knows how to run large operations, small operations. She understands how to make it fun, but how to make it interesting. Uh, she's just a, a great, great partner to have. So she was, I put her on the board of directors as the industry seat. And she was also on the board of advisors on the, with the customers and, and board of advisors overall. Okay, yeah. thank you. Interesting. Darius, do you have a question? Sorry, I'm driving. Hey, Jeff, I'm a great conversation. Thank you so much. Guy, I had watched Profitex from the, a distance and it was very interesting to see it get acquired. So great job on that. The, your point about picking the right investors is very important because that's what we're going through right now. Of course, Jeff's point about advisory board is the same as well. But how do you pick the, I guess the question is different stages have different types. If you're raising a pre-seed round, you could, these days, you could fill it with just angel investors. Mm-hmm. And you don't have that level of a due diligence or, let's say, a, a wide network that you would expect from a VC that you're going into a A round. Yeah, so just wondering about what you see, think, different stages, what's happening today that you see. Yeah, and, and to, so one caveat, 
I'm not an expert on today's. I, my last roadshow was probably about five, six years ago. So I am, I'm, I'm hundred. How about that? I'm about hundred percent wrong in what I'm going to say because I just didn't touch VCs lately. But I, the, the recommendation that I would give you is that even if you go with angels, even if you go another rule that I, I actually didn't follow, you should not work with families. You should not work with friends, which I violated that actually many times, but you should not take money from your family, I think. That's my belief. But even if you take angel money, I would still build the processes, the financial documentation trail as if you're a billion-dollar publicly held company because doing it later in life is way tougher than starting from scratch the right way. At the beginning, we, we used Ernst & Young. They were fantastic accountants, fantastic. And try to use an accountant even if you don't need to. So the paper trail will go. There will be no skeletons in any closet. Everything is lined up. Every, the transparency will be there, first with the angels, which they deserve it. But when you then go to A, because you'll be successful, You'll go to A, you'll go to B. When you think that $5 billion will get you where you are, try to raise 15 because there's never, there's never thing like that, that the planned dollars will actually get you the runway that you believe. And the same thing, if you believe that you're going to uh, get to a $10 million company from zero to 10 in, in, in four years, you may plan it, the best plan in the world, you'll probably take six years, right? Now, the caveat is also lately there's more and more companies that are going from zero to a billion. Really, a few unicorns, friend of mine, unbelievable execution, just fantastic to see from the side, and fantastic to see from the side. And I'm I'm full of envy also, right? It's amazing how they build it so quickly. And by the way, from the side it seems very easy. I know it's not easy, <laughs> and we didn't even talk about the bumps that I had on the. There was there were times that I couldn't even pay salaries. And Jeff, that's another topic that we could definitely talk I, about. I think that needs to be a whole separate room. There's, I've cut out about 15, uh, 15 things I wanted to go after with you on, because I know okay. you're probably yeah. starting to run out of time. Let me ask you two questions, two last questions. And boy, I'd love to have you back if you'd, if you'd, uh, if you can make the time. What do you think the key points are? Uh, let me ask you a different way. What do you think the analyst world gets wrong about uh, trying to understand the startup world? Okay, so that's a good question to ask. That can can open a Pandora box. I actually, I just I met a, I met a few of the old AMR analysts about about a week ago in an unpleasant, actually not was not supposed to be was not a planned event, but we met we we spoke about the old days and you tried to romanticize the old days and especially me, I was the vendor and I was the only vendor in this in this audience. An analyst from the past came to me and shook my hand and said, "Oh, I am." doesn't matter his name, such and such. And I told him, hey, listen, I'm Guy, and I remember you very clearly. The fact that you don't remember me is how I remember it, because you just didn't want to stick with me because I wasn't a vendor. I was no one. Yeah. And at the time, I was no one. I think that the analysts, and not all of them, by the way, hey, let's not put everyone in the same box, but there's a that, lot of- That's uh, one way of saying it. Other vendors. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of other vendors, other analysts that are unique. I really like, how Tony built, Tony and Omaha and the, 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 the gang at AMR, research build AMR, because they were keen to learn. And I think that a lot of analysts are afraid to talk about the future because people will record them and come back in two years and tell them, you were wrong. Hey, it's okay to be wrong. It's yeah. about the future, right? It's okay to be wrong. But if you're not wrong and if you're not putting a bet out there, you're missing the point. In order to be less wrong, how about listening to those startups entrepreneurs that a lot of time, and I agree with Paula, a lot of time they're full of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, if a VC put a $10 million check or $50 million check in someone, let's listen to what this person has to say before that we just eliminate them because they're a vendor. And I think that's where the analysts are, are, are missing out today. Yeah, you're you're going to love a conversation that Brian and I had last night. I'm building a hypothesis that I think the best way to interpret the future of retail tech is to understand what the evolution in the startup community. I think it's better than even 
talking to the big folks because one, the startup community will communicate far more actively about what 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 the individual technologies are, and I think they're far better in touch with it. So there's going to be some really interesting stuff we're going to do in the next uh, couple, three or four months, drilling down on that very that very point. Hey, the last point I will leave you with, and gosh, thank you for your time. It's, it's just been amazing. I, I can think of at least three or four other uh, rooms that I'd love to do with you. What points do you really want to hammer home on for the founder community? You've, been, you've done it twice now. You've successfully done it twice. What are the points, and you probably have already said them all because you're so uh, thorough in your analysis, but what are the, maybe the three points that you want to make sure every founder has drilled into their head? Not the, the, the number one, I think that people underestimate how being a CEO is a lonely position. I would recommend them finding other entrepreneur co-founders to join them. I think that having a three is uh, a magic number. Three entrepreneur going together. But I think two is double the chance than one. And I cannot tell you how many times I was calling Adam, who I called my co-founder. Adam joined me, by the way, about six months after I joined Profitex. But I call him a co-founder for a reason. I said, hey, Adam, I'm just going to vent. Just listen. <laughs> and that's it. We actually had, actually, as part of the management team, we had a card that called vent. And if, you, if someone dropped the card on your desk, you just listen. You didn't need to solve the problem. You didn't need to say anything because it's just so relaxing to just talk to someone who listens. So I think, number one, found a co-founder to join you on the journey. It's a very lonely position. Number two, find the right VCs that will be your partner. Assume, like finding your significant other, assume. You, you never know. It could be just a year. could be five. could be 50. Assume that you're trying to find a partner for life and find the VC, the right VCs that you can, you can collaborate with that adds value. On the marketing, break it down to the, the different communities. Break it down from a PR. I didn't, spoke, I didn't even speak about PR. It's probably on the next room we can talk about PR. But break the marketing into branding, lead generation. Break it down because marketing is a big bucket. Not every bucket is like the other. So break it down. And start small and then grow with that. And so that's why I think uh, quickly. Wow, that's fantastic. We're well over an hour and I know you're, you're ready to, to scram. Anybody, any last questions or we'll just uh, we'll uh, say our, our goodbyes? Going three. Oh. I already moved my next appointment to stay in. So <laughs> I won't keep you guys. I, have, <laughs> I am a bad room host because I meant this to be an hour, but gosh, know, guy is so responsible. So there's so much wisdom that's the knowledge that we're dropping. So go ahead, Darius. What do you got? Uh, I think just the information. First of all, guy, what you, you said, you might be 100% wrong, but you are actually 100% correct. I think from what you said. The, the getting the accounting and the books in order and really being ready for due diligence is a key part. And that's what I'm trying to do right now, actually trying to figure out on our accounting software and, uh, you know, find, finding it like a part-time even a CFO to help out with the process. I think the other part that I, it really resonated with me is the advisory panel or board or whatever the name one gives it. I've also made some pretty you know big mistakes and mostly because of my inexperience in the past not because of the advisors but now i don't even treat it as we have these meetings and going over the board two, twice a year it's like a, a working relationship and mm -hmm. it's just an ongoing thing i was wondering is that also something that you see changing with the remote work and just more like distributed people from all over the world just more efficient to do it that way yeah, some things that in the past, when I was actually describing the Board of Advisors as twice a year face-to-face, -face, it hit me again that we're in a world of everything is through webinars and Zooms and meetings and people are getting also Zoom fatigue. But yeah, I have a lot of friends who actually collected also a bunch of uh, VC money through, through Zoom without meeting anyone in person. Uh, so I would strongly recommend, yeah, the BOA, the Board of Advisors, if you do twice a year a, a two-hour session, you could definitely do a 30-minute session a month and then distribute time. Listen, they are there not just to tell you what they think they should do or what you, they think you should do. I, I would like them to do some real work, some go back to their 
partners and ask questions about your company and get back to you. You're, you're paying them equity. You, that's a lot of, that's, equity itself is very scarce as well. You only have 100% of it. And when you're giving it away, sometimes for you as the entrepreneur is, is actually giving your arms and legs. It's more than, it's more than the, the dollars, right? It's easier to pay someone sometimes than giving equity. So when you give them equity, expect a lot from them. Just prescribe in advance what the relationship is like. What will you ask them every month to do? And minimize the time. Hey, I only need you one hour a month from you. And if I, do, if I go above that, let me know. So you, you have the relation. And by the way, I totally agree with you on CFO. I totally underestimated the CFO for the second at ProfitX. I can tell you that, again, we, at, at ProfitX, I made new mistakes. I didn't make the same mistakes as, as, as the mantra. And on my next gig, I'm sure that I'll make new mistakes again, but not I'll, I'll try not to make the same mistake that I made in ProfitX. One of the mistakes was I underestimated the CFO position. When I hired Amanda, that's where, that's where the, the, the caliber of our financials, of overall process work, just jumped three level up. And Amanda is just, was just amazing. She's still amazing. She's at Zebra, by the way, was promoted twice at Zebra. And I'm sure she's staying here. And that's another gift I gave to Zebra, the people. The people that we, we had at, at Propitech staying here and contributing to Zebra growth on a continuous basis. I think that's where we'll pull the plug. Guy, thank you so much for your time. I'm literally writing the email for about two or three additional rooms if you've got the time. I just think think yeah, some of the points you made let, were fantastic. Let, Jeff, let me just end up with what I just said because I was thinking about it. That uh, I, I truly believe it's all about the people. And so it's all about your people as an entrepreneur. It's all about the co-founder. It's all about the management. It's all about the employees. And if you give them the right guidance, they will then serve the customers. And guess what? It's also all about the people. I had just recently an all-time customer of mine was putting a a LinkedIn uh, message about how amazing ProfitEq is. And I I didn't ask him, but it's all about the people because when you contribute, they contribute. It's all about give and take, and it's all about making sure that the people are empowered. So I would say all across the board, it's all about the people. Yeah. What a great place to to cut it off at. And that's a theme that's coming out of every one of these rooms. I intuitively knew it, but I never really put the the words to it. Boy, it is a relationship business for sure. And that's probably the biggest tip I guess we can leave with the founders is if you aren't building a relationship, you're doing it wrong. With that, sir, thank you so much for your time. The email for the next three rooms is on its way at some point in the next next, uh, few days. Jeff, thanks for having me. Fantastic. My pleasure. Talk to you all later. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For more info, refer to the pod notes below. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us grow. I'm your host, Jeff Roster, analyst at large. If you want to connect, follow us on Twitter at Jeff PR or at Brian Sathanation or connect with us on LinkedIn. Visit my website at roster.retail.com or brians at iterate.ai. Until next time, stay safe and have a great week.